So vectors, <coughs> we're going to start with rectangular, their rectangular form. And occasionally when we need to, we're going to use polar form and switch back and forth between the two. So let's begin with notation. We're going to use a lot of letters for variables uh, around u and v, and sometimes w. Uh, just like we used x and y for real number uh, variables, we use z for complex. We use letters like v, uh, u and v for vectors. So if you're in two dimensions, it looks a lot like a point, except we're going to use different way, a different grouping symbol. So I call these diamond brackets instead of parentheses. So you know you have a vector because you have diamond brackets. So that's one way to write a vector. Uh, the other way to write the same vector, unfortunately, uses i's and another letter j. So when you're dealing with vectors, I mean something completely different. So this is called IJ notation. Now we're assuming we're in two dimensions here, as so we have an x and a y coordinate. So these are describing the same vector. It's very easy to plot this vector out on a graph. You go over three, go up two, now before, we graphed everything as a point or a dot. Vectors are the arrow from that point to the origin. So a vector is an arrow, not just uh, the dot at the head of the arrow. So vectors graph is arrows, not points. All right, so that is in two dimensions. So if I talked about R2, pretty sure I have. R2 is R times R. Here's a real number line. Here's another real number line. If you take their product, you get the plane that you graph on. So that is R2. It's also a good character in Star Wars, but uh, we're about to look at R3. So in three dimensions, so most people agree that our world has at least three dimensions. If you consider time, it's four. And then depending on what else you're doing, there could be a lot more dimensions. But I don't think anybody's arguing that our world is two-dimensional. So it's at least three dimensions. So of course, we need vectors that live in three dimensions. So in three dimensions, we would have three coordinates. It could look like 3, 2, 1. So you want to think of this as x, y, z. The other notation. 3i plus 2j plus 1k. So this is called ijk notation. Now in three dimensions, it's pretty useless to graph because most of us are graphing on a flat surface and you cannot graph properly your third axis, your z axis. Uh, so the best way, if you do need to visualize, you can use uh, computer software that lets you rotate the camera around and actually look at uh, different views of a three-dimensional picture, but looking at, uh, at it on a screen. Uh, so we're not going to spend too much time trying to graph what these vectors look like. For example, 3, 2, 1, I'll do my best effort to graph it. So I'll put out some graph paper. So the first problem is you have three axes. We like to draw two of them the regular way. But then how do you draw the third one? The best way to draw it would be coming directly out of the paper. But then, of course, it just looks like 
that. So that's not very exciting. So we do is the third axis, we bring it out here as if it's coming forward. And let's see, I always I graph so infrequently in three dimensions. There is a certain order that most people choose. I think we want Z going up and then I think it goes X, Y. Anybody take physics? I feel like X and Y might be switched. All right, we'll just go with this. So how do I graph this 3, 2, 1 vector? Well, it's 3 down the x-axis. So I'll mark off 3 down the x-axis. So go to the right 3. Now 2j, that's 2 down the y-axis. Now it's really hard to measure 2 here because there's no real markings as to how far uh, am I going. So I'm just going to estimate and say right about there. And now we're supposed to go up one. So where does the front of that vector live? So I'll go over three to here. Then I'll go two in this direction. I'm going to go two down the y-axis. And now I'm going to do my best to go up one. So there's up one. So that. That is my vector v. However, when I look at it, it looks like it has a z-coordinate of 0. And it's like sitting right on the bottom plane. Even though I went carefully to the right 3, I came forward 2, and then I did go up 1. But it looks like I went 2 to the right, and then maybe it looks like this is the vector 2, 1, 0. It's not, but it looks like it, and that's a problem with uh, graphing in three dimensions. It's very difficult to distinguish. Uh, so that's not the vector I tried to draw. I did try to draw 3, 2, 1. So generally, I'm not going to spend time graphing in three dimensions. Uh, if you're on a computer and you graph this out, uh, you can rotate the camera or the uh, the world around so that you can get different views on it. So if I could move the view around, it would be easy to see that it's not right on the ground. That actually raises up one. All right, so we're not going to spend much time graphing uh, three-dimensional vectors. So we'll start with addition. So almost everything I graph will be a two-dimensional vector. Things work out the same in three dimensions. You just have an extra coordinate. So we'll look at vector addition. And we're going to look at it in two dimensions. So if I asked you to add these two vectors, and you get to make up whatever addition you want, what would be a natural choice for the vector uh, I would get if I added these two vectors together. What would be a reasonable choice for my x coordinate? A plus C. Oh, very good. A plus C. So we'll do the natural thing, which is add the x's, and then we'll add the y's for our new y coordinate. That is vector addition. You just add the corresponding coordinates together. That's it. All right, example 2 comma negative 1 plus 3 comma 7. All right, add those together. Give me a single vector. It should be very straightforward what to do. Any questions on the 5, 6 vector when you add those two together? All right, now what I want you to do is graph both of the vectors on the left side. 
So graph those two vectors on the left side. So give me a graph with two arrows, represent one representing each vector. So one of them goes two to the right, down one. The other one goes three to the right, up seven. So any questions on the two vectors graphed out? This is just like graphing points. You're just drawing arrows instead. <clears throat> so now in green, I'm going to graph the 5, 6 vector, the vector that we said was the sum of the other two. All right, so there's our two vectors. If I add the two blues together, I get the green. So visually, we see it on a graph. We did it algebraically. Think of an operation just on the graph. How can you take these two blue vectors to get the green vector? And it involves moving that bottom vector around. How can I move that bottom vector so I get a triangle? That vector fits in perfectly in one spot. So I'm going to redraw that vector. Oh, let's use a nice color. I'll use this basic color right there. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. It's going to be awesome. All right, so I'm going to move that vector. I'm going to move it up 7 and to the right 3. So I'm moving it up 7 to the right 3. And it's going to end up right here. All right, and this is called head-to-tail addition. So you basically go along your first vector, and then you take your second vector, and you line it up so it starts where your first vector ended. So you're basically making a path, or this is a fancy words concatenation. You're doing one vector and then the other vector right afterwards. And that's how we get, and we should give these names that are nicer than the names right there. So I'll call this guy U plus V equals W. Oh, I lost my blue marker. Get it back. Okay. So our, our vector U is at the bottom. There's V. And here's another copy of U right there. So go across V, go across U, and you get W. So algebraically, it shouldn't matter if I add u plus v or v plus u. That's what we call commutative property, right? So let's think about in the graph, what would the adding in the other order do? So we're going to go across u, and then I'm going to take a copy of v. So I'm going to take a copy of v, and I'm going to begin at the end of u. So v says go to the right 3 and up 7. So I'm going to go, I'm starting here, I'm going to go 3 to the right, and up 7, and that lands me right where I want to be up there.
I'm going to connect it with a relatively straight, not have too many arrowheads converging in one spot. All right, so head to tail works either order. You can go U plus V or V plus U. And that makes sense because addition should be uh, com commutative. All right, so that's the geometric a way to think about addition. And we'll go to scalar multiplication next. All right, so we know about multiplication. What about this word scalar? Maybe I should describe scalar before I describe multiplication. So basically, a scalar is a real number. The reason that we're calling them scalars now and not just numbers is because we're mainly going to be operating on vectors. So when we have something that's not a vector, we give it a special name. So you've been working with scalar numbers for pretty much ever. The only difference is we're calling them scalars to distinguish them from being vectors right now. So whereas most objects or most things in these sections are vectors. And vectors are either going to come from R2 or they're going to come from R3. They're either going to be two-dimensional vectors or three-dimensional vectors. So scalar is just uh, a number in R1, not a vector, not a two or three dimensional vector. So we will use uh, generally alpha and beta, so Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma for scalars. Now, if you can't write an alpha, you can basically use a lowercase a. Uh, beta, you can basically use a capital B. Gamma, we don't really have a letter that looks like that. So that's one you kind of just have to write out. It's sort of like an O, but not really. Or part of an 8, I guess. <coughs> so we're going to use those for scalar uh, numbers. So here's how we multiply. So scalar multiplication. All we do is distribute. So every component gets multiplied by alpha. So this is alpha A comma alpha B. So it works just like distribution. And of course, if we did scalar multiplication in three dimensions, it's not terribly exciting. You just go alpha A, alpha B, alpha C. So you need to make sure you multiply every coordinate by alpha. So that's what it looks like in two and three dimensions. So what does this scaling, uh, scalar multiplication on a uh, graphical viewpoint? So we'll take uh, that, that 2, negative 1 vector. Well, let's make it even. Let's just go 2, 1. So I'm going to let v equal 2, 1. And I want to know what is 2v, what is 3v, and then what is negative 1v. So these are easy to compute. Just go 2 times the vector 2, 1, which is 4, 2. And then go ahead, do the second and third multiplication 
in here, they're just as easy. You're just distributing. And then I want you to graph all four vectors. I'm doing my best to draw them on top of each other without directly writing over them, so you can still kind of see all three going up the same direction. All right, so any questions on the graph right there? Of the V, 2V, and 3V. All right, so if you had to describe scalar multiplication, what it does graphically, what would be a good way to describe what positive integer values do? Two and three. I think you can see what four would do. So basically, you're going to just stretch it out or scale it by that number. So we use positive uh, integer values, so it got two times bigger, three times bigger, four times bigger. When we did negative, it went the opposite direction. So <clears throat> it just scales in the same direction. So that's another reason why we call them scalars, because we multiply it scales the vector. It doesn't change the direction, but it does change the amount or the scale in that direction. So it scales each vector. Negatives turn them around. So negatives reverse the direction. Let's look at small values now. So we'll do 1 half v. So 1 half times 2, 1 is 1 comma 1 half. So we'll graph that out, running out of colors. Go orange. So there is one half V right there. Probably chose too big of a too wide of a marker, but you can scale them with small values, makes them shorter. So it scales both directions, positive and negative, and you can also make vectors shorter or longer. There is one special number that's really boring to multiply by. What is zero v going to equal for this vector? So we got zero zero. All right, how do you graph zero zero or zero v? So that's the origin. You can't do very much. Now I'm running out of colors completely. Oh man. What's a good negative? Pink. Purple. There we go. Like the choker. All right. So there's the zero vector right there at the origin. OK. The zero vector, we write it in a special way. We use 
<coughs> you could write it just like regular zero, but then people think that you're talking about the number zero. So the zero vector, what we do is we just make it extra bold. So I usually go around it maybe three or four times. So it makes it a very bold zero. So bold zero means a zero vector. It's the vector with all coordinates of zero. This was the two dimensional, the zero vector in two dimensions. The zero vector in three dimensions is just zero, zero, zero. And it's written the exact same way. So that is addition and scalar multiplication. And now we're ready to talk about magnitude or modulus. So with magnitude or modulus, there are two ways to write it. And it's the same way we did with complex numbers. So if your vector is AB, this is square root A squared plus B squared. So it's the exact same uh, magnitude or modulus you were dealing with with complex numbers. No different. So that's what it looks like in two dimensions. If you're in three dimensions, what do you think we get in three dimensions? So I want something very similar, but upping the dimension. So we just fit the same pattern, a squared plus b squared plus c squared square root. So that is magnitude in three dimensions. It works exactly the same as two dimensions. You just get the extra coordinate. All right, so find the magnitude of the vector 2, 1. Same one we were working with before. So compute that right now. Should only take a couple seconds. Just use the 2 and the 1 for A and B. So you should get square root 5 for that magnitude. Now, some sources that you're going to read also use the double bars just like complex numbers used. So sometimes you might see it with double bars instead of single bars. It means the same thing. So we'll look at some properties now. So any vector is going to have a magnitude or a modulus that is 0 or more. You're never going to get negatives out of these. You're not going to take something square root and get a negative. So it's always 0 or more. Now if you know the magnitude of your vector is 0, this happens exactly when So if you think about the way magnitude works, how in the world could you get a zero out of this number right here that I just put a box around? How could I get zero out of this? What would I need a, b, and c to equal? Zero. They all have to be zero. If any one of them is not zero, then the sum is going to be greater than zero, and your square root's not going to be zero. So if you get zero for your magnitude, that means your vector has to equal 0. So the way we're going to write that is use that bold 0 right there. So the magnitude is 0 exactly when your zip vector is 0 itself. Now 
Now we'll look at the magnitude of negative v. So if you know vector v look like this, we just saw that negative v is the same vector, but pointing the opposite direction. So what would, how would their lengths or magnitudes be related? Remember, we're measuring the length of these vectors. So they'd be exactly the same. Doesn't matter which way it's pointing. All right, the last useful property, if you go alpha times v, so again, alpha is a scalar, alpha times v, that's going to be absolute value of alpha times your vector magnitude of v. So the first one's absolute value of the scalar. The second one is the magnitude of V. All right, so those are pretty much the only algebraic properties we really need for uh, magnitude. There is a triangle inequality, but that's a lot fancier than we need to get. So we'll leave that one off. So we looked at when magnitude is zero, we got the zero vector. Let's look at when magnitude is one. What do you think we would call a vector that has a magnitude one? What word do we use when we're thinking about one in math? It's a lot like my least favorite card game, Uno. Circle radius one. Bicycle with one wheel. So we're gonna go unit. So that's our general word when we want one, is unit, uni or unit. Why is Uno your least favorite card game? Because it never ends. But it does. It takes forever. Is that when you play with Hitman or something? <laughs> or hit, win hit people? All right, unit vector. So now we're going to look at how do points and vectors relate. So the best way to think about points or dots, there's two points, and a vector is a way to go between two points. So I'm going to call this point AB, and the other point will be CD, and I want to know the vector from, so vector V that goes from AB to CD. So you're going to find out that my vectors, or my letter V looks a lot like a U. When I want to write the letter U, I make sure that has a little foot on it. So you want to make sure that you can tell you apart your V's and your U's. When you're writing in English, you can be very sloppy and not write letters correctly because people know it's in a word, so it's a V or a U based on what word it's inside of. But in math, when you're writing, you want to be careful. Uh, a lot of times it's not easy to tell if that's a U or a V. So you want to make sure you use on like your V's. So my U's are going to have a foot on them. Some people distinguish their V's are sharp points and their U's look like that. I'm not one of those people. Um, you'll find a lot of people's ones and sevens look the same, or twos and Z's. So I fixed that problem the European way. Um, other people write curly twos like that, and then they have z's that have sharp edges. But again, I write too quickly to distinguish those. All right, so how do we get this vector v? 
What I'm going to do is draw a bow and arrow to help you remember. So it is hunting season. So there's my, oh, that's not the best bow. There we go. All right, what I want you to remember is end minus start. And the way you remember that is with a bow. If you use a bow, you first, you fix the front of it. You attach the, you attach the arrow at the front before you pull the string back. You don't do it the other order. All right, so you make sure your arrow is locked in at the front, and then you pull it back. You'll have big problems if you go the other way. Try to pull your string back and then lock your arrow in. Probably won't turn out very well for anybody near you. All right, so n minus start, that is very, very useful. So in our case, our vector v is going to equal n minus start. So in this case, end is c d minus start is a b. So we're doing end point minus start point. And another way to remember that, if you are using your watch to time, you want to see how long it took you to drive to school, you take your arrival time minus your uh, starting time, or your end time minus your start time. That's how you uh, can see how much time has passed. So you're doing the exact same thing here. And when we subtract points, we get vectors. So this is the vector c minus a comma d minus b. You're just subtracting the x's, subtracting the y's. So that's how we get our vector between two points. So we'll do an example now. So vine vector v from negative 1, 2, 2. Four, six. So while you're busy computing the vector, I will graph those two points and then the vector in between. So I want you to compute the vector. So any questions on 5, 4? I graph the two points uh, as points with the black marker. And then I just connected them with the green arrow right there. That's the vector, which is over 5 and up 4. So the next topic is when are two vectors equal? When are they the same vector? So in two dimensions, if I told you two vectors are equal, what do you think would have to be true about these vectors? So we're in two dimensions. So is it enough just to match their x-coordinates? So this vector goes over 1, and this vector goes over 1. Are they the same vector? Yeah. Nope. So you've got to match your x-coordinates and your y-coordinates. So your x's and your y's have to be the same. So you have to match your x's and y's. And in three dimensions, if you had a, b, c, Equal, uh, 
Let's do X, Y, Z. So in three dimensions, it's the same. You just match your X's. So X equals A. You have to match your Y's. Y equals B. And your Z equals C. So you have to match all three coordinates. Vectors absolutely exist in four dimensions, five dimensions, and all positive integer dimensions. And everything I'm telling you works for all those as well. You just match all their coordinates. So we'll do parallel first and anti-parallel. So parallel vectors. We saw parallel vectors drawn on the notes before. So let's scroll up to where I see a bunch of parallel vectors. That is right up here. So I think we all agree, at least all the positive vectors Forget that negative vector, but all the positive vectors are parallel. Right there. They're all going the same direction. So what does that mean about parallel vectors? They are positive multiples of each other. So all parallel vectors will be scalar multiple, positive scalar multiple of the original vector. So that's what it means to be parallel. Anti-parallel means they point the opposite direction. That means it's a negative scalar multiple of the original vector. So that's what it means to be parallel or anti-parallel. So one notation for parallel is the double vertical line. That means they're parallel. So u is parallel to v. So u is parallel to v exactly when there exists an alpha greater than 0 such that alpha u equals v, such that I can multiply one vector by a positive scalar and get the other vector. So that's what it means to be parallel. So you might think, oh, it's unfair. Why, do, why don't we multiply v by a scalar? How can I move the scalar to the other side? What algebra can I do to move? Because <coughs> in tight. Alpha to the other side. How do you unmultiply by alpha? Just by alpha? So I can divide by alpha. What if I can't use the word divide? Because I only told you about yeah, scalar. One over so we multiply by the reciprocal, 1 over alpha. So we multiply by 1 over alpha. We're scalar multiplying both sides. We have uh, alpha times 1 over alpha. It's going to cancel out to 1 equals 1 over alpha v. So it doesn't matter what side you multiply on. You can, As long as it's not 0, you can always move it to the other side by multiplying by the reciprocal. So that's parallel, anti-parallel. I don't know a symbol for it. You want to be careful because this symbol right here means not parallel, which does not mean the opposite of parallel. It means they're not, two vectors are not parallel. Those would be two not parallel vectors. That's different than being anti parallel. Anti parallel is very specific. Anti parallel means. Uh, that u is equal to alpha v, or I should write it the same way, alpha u equals v for some alpha less than 0. So they're negative multiples of each other.
So that's parallel and anti-parallel. So I want to find uh, the unit vector parallel to the vector for negative 3. So first of all, let's see. Maybe the magnitude of v is already equal to 1. It's not. It's way too big. But let's go ahead and compute it. Magnitude of v, that's going to be square root 4 squared plus negative 3 squared. One thing, when you're finding magnitudes, Anytime you have a negative coordinate, when you find the magnitude, you're going to square it, and it's going to become positive. So what you don't want to do is make this mistake right here. So don't do that. You're always going to be having positive terms when you square them. So don't do that. So we've got 